convey to everyone here from the George Watercolor Society what a remarkable exhibition this is. It's not always easy to hang contemporary work in a museum setting, um, but I have to say that Elizabeth and I had a great thrill and delight in hanging all the work here from the George Watercolor Society. And there's a great breadth and depth of talent represented in the three galleries here. So thank you all. Tonight, we have, excuse me, Ms. Dorinda Cheek, who is originally a native of Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is my home state, so nice kindred spirit. She has taught previously at the College Preparatory and the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. She is a signature member of the Georgia Watercolor Society, as well as a member of the Tennessee and Louisiana Watercolor Societies. She's a member of the American Impressionist Society, the Oil Painters of America, Lin Air Florida, Lin Air Georgia, and Women Painters of the Southeast. Tonight she's going to talk about travel to paint, paint to travel. Thanks for getting out at night and coming over here. Um, so my question is, how many of you are painters? Almost all. How many of you are watercolor painters? And how many of you are oil painters or critics? No, some of you are raising your hand. You're like me, you're a dual media. You know, I love them both, so I paint them both. Um, well, this is going to be very casual, and um, feel free to make comments and that kind of thing. I'll be looking around to see if anybody's kind of, you know, interested in what we're doing. If not, I'll speed up, you know, and <laughs> it. Um, because, uh, you know, I have a background in art education, uh, but at presently I'm not a professor, so the, my teaching now with adults is much more casual, and I kind of go in for things that I think they're going to be interested in. Uh, but I do like to talk about um, how to travel with your paints and um, kind of what to take as far as supplies, um, how to pack it, so, how many of you have traveled abroad and taken paints and things like that to paint? Okay, two nods. Okay, good. How many would like to do that? Okay. Um, you know, it's a little different, I think. So, what I thought I would do is kind of talk about it and give you a little bit of a history background about painting outside. And certainly, John, you can help out with some of the history if I get hung up on some of these um, artists or their paintings or whatever, because I had planned to pick on Elizabeth, but since she's not here. Um, and, um, and we'll just kind of go through the, my, my little slideshow. And then I brought stuff, because, you know, as a visual artist, it's all about stuff, um, to talk about what kind of supplies I usually take, um, you know, with watercolors, what kind of paper, what kind of journals. Uh, with oil painting, you know, how I pack my oil paintings to fly on a plane and get there successfully, um, and that kind of thing. So that's all kind of a give and take, you know, you, I want you to come up and we'll talk about things and ask me questions and that kind of thing. So I appreciate your smiling faces. I'm too nervous to be up here. Um, <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> also, I have to read my notes, so I have to get up here in the line. Um, Okay, so my topic is travel to paint, so to paint and paint to travel. Uh, because to be able to go travel, I have to paint and sell my paintings, so I make some money, so then I can buy my airline tickets and that kind of thing. So it kind of goes both ways for me. If I'm not having a real good year, I'm not going to get to go anywhere. So um, the deal we cut when I quit teaching full time and gave up being art department chairman at the school was that my art would pay for itself. So I do a trip or whatever, I pay for it. And I don't, you know, beg from him, but he chips in when he can. Um, so, um, you know, taking your art on the road or on plain air in the open air. How many of you have heard that term before? You heard of it? Okay, good. Um, So, you know, to me, it was like the first time I went, I remember I was like trying to think what to take because I was going to be gone like two weeks. 
um, to Italy. And I had to have clothes, you know. And so I knew I had a weight limit on everything. And so I, you know, was trying to like figure out how much can I take and get away with for the weight limit. Um, and then how much and how to take it so I don't get stopped at the airport um, and things taken away from me. And that does happen. Um, and then, how do I transport my paintings once I do some stuff? How do I get it back in the suitcase and get it back home? So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. And please ask questions if I run across something. Um, well, so, on plein air means in the open air. And, um, you know, it made Monet famous. Right? We know him. And it drove Van Gogh crazy. Okay. So when you think about painting outside, there really is a lot to it as far as how to set up, how to compose. You can't paint the whole world. You know, you're painting on a small piece of canvas or paper. So how do you do that? How do you move your colors? All of that. So um, I don't think that was what drove him crazy, but um, we usually think about it. I, I'm gestural. <laughs> I was just like, put your hands down, but I can't. Okay. Um, but the French term uh, on plein air um, came from them, but they did not invent. Okay, So artists <coughs> since back in the Renaissance time that we can actually see images and whatever painted and sketched outside. This is Everett Durer. Are y'all familiar with him from your college art in the dark? Um, so he was a German Renaissance painter. There's not a whole lot of this. Um, and so he did these um, really exquisite studies, watercolor studies, sitting outside. Um, and then, you know, maybe in some of his other paintings he did, I don't know if you know some of his paintings, but perhaps I'll be correct um, You know, he would use some of these studies when he did some of his old paintings, you know, and put them in there. Um, but he also did huge things in watercolor, like this vista sitting outside. So even though, I don't know if we can see the date on this, but it's probably, what, 15, 1600s? 1500s. Yeah, 1500s. You know, here's an artist who has an eye for the landscape, you know, and can portray it, um, you know, in watercolor. So, I mean, I just still think that's amazing. He's one of my favorites. Um, okay. um, but mostly, Artists either did little studies outside, little watercolor sketches or something, charcoal. Then they would go into their studio and then they would do these humongo full paintings, very dark backgrounds. Um, and the studies usually ended up in the trash because they weren't considered the final product, they weren't considered art. In 1841, isn't that great? Um, they invented the metal tubes to carry paint. So now, artists that were painting in their studios, instead of having to buy the ground pigment and mix it with the oil, that's why they all had apprentices, you know, that they got to do that work. And then painting in the studio, because then you'd have this goofy paint, you know, you had to paint with it. Uh, now it was being squeezed down into these tubes where they could put it into tubes, and so they could go outside. <coughs> so, about that same time, somebody came up with what they call the box easel. We call it the French easel. Anybody have one? Got some, I see that's not. You know how hard that thing is to put together <laughs> and how heavy it is. But for them, it was a breakthrough. You know, they were leaving the studios and they were going outside, taking their paints, setting up their easels, and they're able to paint. And just from looking through the history slides, I can tell you it was like a uh, prerequisite that you also dressed in your finest. But we will notice he has a hat. And if you paint outside, you know how important that is. This is um, Corot, Camille Corot. Um, and he painted with a group and kind of he was like the grandfather of this group that painted in France in the forest outside of Fountain uh, Blue, which was Napoleon's hunting grounds. 
So it was away from Paris. It was out. It was very wooded and protected. And so this whole group of painters called the Barbizon painters, and they called themselves the Barbizon School of Painting, went out into this terrain and, um, and painted because now they could carry everything out. So I love this one because this is from that era, and there's the, the little painter down in there, you know, and he's painting those huge, you know, rocks and stuff like that. So um, this kind of gave everybody the idea, you know, that you could go out and make a landscape, and, and that was complete. You didn't have to go back into the studio and do it again. Um, one of Gros, and the other thing they did kind of to break away from the studio where you have those really stiff, and there's nothing wrong with them. <laughs> Not that I don't like them, but the dark, still lifes, the fruit, the grass, you know, the dead flower, the skull, or whatever, um, into painting a landscape that contained everyday life and everyday people. This was a big breakthrough. Because artists were painting only the kind of aristocrats, the rich merchants, you know, the wealthy people who could afford to have their portraits done, and who would want to be in a room, an interior, showing off all of their expensive, you know, textiles and books. The big thing was to have your hands on the books that showed that you were learned, you know, you were an educated person. Um, and now the artists are going outside and they're saying it's okay to paint the everyday scenes and common people. So, here's another one. You can see just, you know, it's just a farm. So, I mean, this was revolutionary. We think about it today, we're like, oh, you know, it's a landscape, but it was revolutionary back then. And this is George Ennis. Is anybody familiar with Ennis? Um, he was also part of that painting outside kind of Barbizon school. Again, he's not an impressionist. Okay, he's, we think of him more as a tonalist. But you know, he's getting into the landscape and painting what he sees. And then this is Pizarro. Have you heard of him? Okay. Um, the group of impressionists that we think of as the French impressionists. Um, actually was a splinter group. There was like several artists in it. And Pizarro was one of the oldest. So he was a, an established painter in his own right. And then he kind of took up, you know, friends and whatever with some of the younger painters. Uh, but he too painted outside and around in the villages where he lived. So, you know, here we're seeing now you notice a little difference in how the paint's being applied. So now he's kind of breaking up his strokes. They're not, you know, smooth and perfect. He's showing, you know, how the light is coming and hitting surfaces. So it's real important to show light and light source and how it affected the landscape. Another one of his, again, it's a little more, what we'd call sketchy. You know, it's not completely all filled in and perfect. <coughs> And that was kind of the way the Impressionists wanted to paint because they wanted things to look like they were in the moment. You know, like you could just be there. You could just walk up, you could feel it, you know. Um, this is the way the, the landscape looked, the way the temperature was, the season. Um, and so they would sit and paint. He looks like he must be sitting in the middle of the road on that one, his point of view. But, um, and then, of course, we have. Um, and he gets all the credit, <laughs> you know. And I think it's because um, he was very good at marketing. So after he struggled for years, and if y'all have never read this book, you need to read it. It's called Private Lives of the Impressionist. It's by Susan Brody. Yeah. It's been out a number of years, but I just read it recently. Um, it's very interesting. These people actually had nothing for years because the critics and the public did not like the work, right? It was sketchy, didn't fit the, you know, genre everybody else was painting and hanging in the salon. It didn't get in the salon, and that meant, well, they weren't important painters if it couldn't be in the Paris salon. So he was one of the few that during his lifetime 
he got recognition and his work actually sold. Um, he, he painted outdoors so much. He loved it so much. He actually constructed a studio on a boat and he would float up and down the river and paint the riverbanks. You've seen those paintings of the um, trees, all of the, on the riverbank, the reflections and all of that. He painted those from a boat. And I think at this time, this probably is his, his uh, wife, Camille, that's sitting in there with him. And she's kind of shaded, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And then this is by, this painting is uh, one of his friends. So um, they, you know, they kind of painted each other. Um, and here he is painting in a garden. This one is by Renoir. So, you know, instead of Renoir painting all the things, he's painting on a painting. Uh, but you can see how young he is in that one, too. So they painted in all seasons. Um, you know, I don't know if he's in the water on this one. You know, if you were a painter and you know about composition, um, you would feel like he must be in a boat because if he's in a bank, you know, if he's on a bank, you might see a little bit more of that. So he may be floating around in a boat and that bit. But you can tell the season on this. What is this one? Looks like fall, you know, because he's got that kind of orange thing that's going. So he's got that nice complementary color scheme, which the impressionists use a lot, you know, bouncing those colors off each other. And again, the short strokes, quick, you know, put it on thickly and save your whites for last. Palomon. Um, one of you know one of his little meadows and poppy scenes. How many of you have been to Giverny? Okay, good. Three, four. Um, they actually do still have meadows like this, and in the uh, early summer, late spring, they are full of poppies. It's gorgeous. So he you know got out there. Of course, he posed somebody for school. Then, does anybody know who this is? Just like that. Yes? Hmm? Yes. Why would you guess that? Well, I cheated. I read a children's book on Renoir. It was excellent. It talked about there are three hands that he had, that even late in life, his wife had to hand in his brush because he couldn't even pick up or put down the brush. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, it just shows you that you don't have to. That's right. That's right. You don't. And, and my man lived to be way up in his 80s. Mm -hmm. so, um, and yes. When, when, his, when his younger artist friends would come to him when he was so crippled, he said, Why do you put yourself through so much pain instead of because the pain passes, but the beauty remains? Aww. And that's, that was mm -hmm. his mantra. The beauty remains. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. He set up, he's got his beach umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a Renoir. Um, I really, you know, just kind of looking through Renoir stuff, I think more of him as a figure painter. I think he's beautiful women and his skin tone. I don't really think of him as being a landscape painter. But, you know, I found several. So he, he enjoyed it. And obviously from that other picture, you know, he got outside of him. And so, um, I read the book on Renoir, my father, by one of his sons. You read that? No, Stumbled on that one. In the little book I read, he was a big believer of children being at home. None of his children went to school until they were 15. <laughs> they painted, they may have, they learned to read, they learned to write. They became doctors and lawyers. Of course. Because he encouraged them to think of it. Another and can you kind of tell from this one, like what season it is? Any clues? Summer. Summer? Yeah, it could be summer. You've got the um, people out here. You can see them they're kind of in the boats and stuff like that. Um, I mean, just really calm. But, you know, if you saw this one next to a Monet, I don't think you really could discern the difference. You know, they're very similar, I think, in techniques. And this is one of my favorites of his. Um, another thing with the Impressionists, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, they like to show people 
being relaxed and enjoying life. You'll see a lot. Of, that's why you have a lot of cafe scenes, you know, and you'll see them voting and hanging out, you know, on the hillsides from the Surat with the, you know, people all standing around. Um, but that was kind of a theme um, that kind of followed through all of their work. Uh, was kind of showing people at leisure. And then this one, um, another of the uh, Impressionist painters, kind of on the fringe. John, you can't with this, but this is Udward Manet in the Um And he was friends with everybody, and the only thing was the rest of them wanted to have their own little show because they couldn't get in the salon. And he was more of a business minded person. He was like, if you don't get in the salon, nobody pays attention to your work. I'm not going to separate myself from the salon to hang with you guys because he knew that they were not going to be well accepted. So he hung on to the salon shows as opposed to doing the impression shows with them. But he was in their circle and he painted with them a lot. And um, his brother ended up marrying uh, more so yeah, yeah. So she was one of the impressions painters too, one of the few women that were And here's his painting. Guess who it is? Brother and his brother. Hmm? his brother and his brother. Well, no, it's our friend, Monet. See, they hung out in the corner. So here he is. He's painting Monet. Um, Monet looks like he's watering his garden or picking flowers. He's even got his chicken. So if you've been to Giverney, you know they still have chickens there. Um, and his wife and young son, two, that he claimed. Um, and then this is one of Manet's paintings, again, one of my favorites. Another thing characteristic of the Impressionists, very strange for that time, um, they didn't mind putting things in the center. And if you look at a lot of their paintings, you'll see a path or a road dead center, you know, we've always talked about composition, like, we never put anything right in the middle, but they didn't care about that. They're talking more about the feeling. You can see that, it, you know, that house is behind there, and it's kind of wooded up, and all that kind of stuff. They want you to get the feeling that you're there, so they didn't worry so much about how the rules said you had to do things. So, I told you they were all friends, so this is um, Pizarro, and he is meeting with a younger artist and kind of giving him some advice because Pizarro told him to the older ones and the, the younger man looked up to him. Um, this guy painted in Provence, there's a hint, um, he is especially known for painting one mountain several times. Does anyone want to guess? Cezanne, very good. So it's Paul Cezanne and their friends, and they're kind of, you know, talking shop there. Later years, here's Paul outside, you know, with his hat on and his jacket. Now, I can see from this, this is his paint jacket. He's serious. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he sat up and, and painted outside of Provence for years and years. Um, did y'all see the Cezanne show? Um, weren't you amazed at his watercolors? Yeah. You know, it, they're very deliberate, and you need to stand back in order to see it come together. I kind of wonder, John, you kind of remember, if some of the pieces, though, that were in the show were really not meant to be final frame paintings. Were they meant to be sketches preliminary for other work? In that central gallery that had nothing but Cezanne's works, uh -huh. and many works on paper, I think many of those were never intended for exhibition. They were in front of studies at the studio. But I think it shows that Perlman was a savvy collector because he bought them and he bought them and they must get it. Yeah. And of course, now that's what we want to see in the study. Sure. In the study. Yeah. So I just, well, I found that very interesting. Um, and if you are a plein air, plein air painter or you like to paint outside, one good way to do it is to pick one subject and try it in different seasons, different light. You know, Monet did that with the haystacks. He did it with the cathedrals, um, different seasons. But try to, you know, kind of narrow in on something 
and it, it's amazing how much you can learn from just that one subject. And here's one of his oil paintings, and I'm not real sure that this one is plenty of because it's pretty complicated. Um, but once you do these studies outside of your subject, it you know kind of internalizes in your head. You know what it looks like before you start doing something else. So. Um, you know, I'm kind of guessing he did some studies. I know he did a lot of pine tree studies. Um, and then kind of put this together in kind of a more vista view um, of the valley. And then that leads us to another painter that you might think is mostly of portraits. So this artist traveled a great deal, but he became friends with the Impressionists. And he went to Giverny, painted down there with them. Um, traveled a lot, uh, did a very famous portrait of a lady in a black dress with her nose turned up. Madame X, who's our artist? John Singer Sargent. So he too was a plein air painter. And this is his painting of, who's been our subject almost? Monet. <laughs> Outside painting. So now whether he did that at the same time Manet did his, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing though because um, Sargent went to Giverny and stayed, um, that it's, it's close around Giverny. That's my guess. It's obviously not right in Monet's backyard. Maybe um, it might be closer. I don't know if that's the river. There's a river back there. Yep. Yep. Is that his name? Um, and you know, obviously that's what he's painting. This, I love this one. Um, this one is probably his sister, Emily, because she was also a plein air painter, even though Hello Art History Books didn't mention her. Right? Um, but he did several. There's, I mean, if you start looking them up, there's several paintings that he did of his sister outside painting. So I thought that was kind of neat. Wouldn't you love to be dressed like that? So. Um, and then here again, here's some other friends out painting. I don't know where her easel is. She must be like doing the, you know, comparison. Um, but look how impressionistic this is. Look how he's adapted, you know, their short strokes, you know, broken color, using the complements, putting color next to each other instead of, you know, blending the whole thing out and that kind of thing. Um, and he is a master of white. I don't know if I've ever seen it. I've seen a sergeant in my life. Um, but you know, his whites are just incredible. They get so much color in them, but they still read. Um, of course, he traveled to Venice. Oh, and I traveled to Venice twice that I know of and more. Um, and Sargent did watercolors. There's like, I've got books of his. And he got in a boat and floated around in the canals and sat there and painted, you know, his watercolor sketches of the canals. Um, one thing interesting about his watercolors, if you, if you go through and look at most of them, a very, very limited palette. Um, a lot, I'm guessing, looks like ultramarine blues with burnt siennas, um, this yellow, maybe a yellow ochre or a Naples. I'm not sure what the colors look like exactly, but the very limited palette, so he didn't carry everything he owned in his box. And then, here's our friend Vincent, um, who did not start off as a plein air painter. He really didn't paint plein air until he moved further south out of Paris and went into um, Arles and then later um, into St. Remy and uh, painted all down in there. So here's one of, you know, all of his stuff is plenty. There's only a few studios, and it's mostly it will be flowers. He set up uh, flowers and still life kind of things. Um, but most of his garden scenes that he painted like this were painted out of the bush. Olive groves. How many have been to San Remy? Have you been to San Remy? Is that the asylum where he lived for a year? But he, he uh, committed himself. He walked in and said, Will you please, you know, come with me. And so he had free reign. He could go out every day. He was the that was his most 
prolific year of his life painting. Because A, there's so many subjects there, but B, he could just come and go. So he had a place to sleep and the food and you know all of that, and then he could go out and paint every day. Um, of course, this one is towards the end of his life. I don't know if this is the very last painting he finished. You know? I know his last painting was a wheat field with crows, and this may be it, yeah, or there may be another one. Um, but again, he went out all times of the day, all seasons. The people in Provence like this crazy because he went out in that hot sun. Because um, they shut down in Europe, but, you know, like midday, they close everything up because it's so dang hot and they don't have air conditioning. So, um, you don't have to be a starving artist <laughs> to enjoy painting outside. And um, I have a, a student of mine who's traveled a great deal. She's been to um, England several times, and she loves the British family. And she's Downton Abbey. Oh my God, she can tell you every year and everything I said. Um, but she has a book of uh, Charles's watercolors, and they are awesome. He's really good. Um, and I read, I read that he didn't think too much about him. He was just kind of painting for himself. And then they finally talked him into, like, well, why don't you sell them or sell prints of them and raise money for charities? And so he does that now so he can actually buy an original um, you find of it. You know, he travels so much. Look at this wonderful yellow water flip uh -oh. Look at this wonderful wet in the wet sky. Beautiful. Um, and he, he did a, I don't know if it's one part in Africa. He likes to go a lot and paint. Just gorgeous. So, <laughs> you know, my, my goal is kind of like um, preaching to the choir on this one. But, you know, you've you got to get out and do it. Uh, when I have new students and they say, oh, I'm going to paint it out. I say, go out on your deck. Go out on your patio. Go out in your front yard. Um, A, get comfortable with your materials because that's the big thing. You don't want to get out there like I did the first time I painted in oils. I was in Giverny. I had decided I was going to go. I heard all about it. I was going. Talked to a friend of mine in Bloomington. And she said, oh, you're going to take your watercolors. No, I'm not. Because I'm going to paint it in oils, and I'm going to be painting there, and I'm going to, I'm going to learn to paint oils. So here I go. I've never even seen a French easel. <laughs> so we get there, and they hand us the French easel. I'll fold it up. And canvases, I'm not kidding, that were this big. Because over there, for plein air, they see painters and they're painting this, this large on stretched canvas. It took me three or four days before I could even get the easel set up in time to <laughs> And then to figure out how to put the paint on there, you know, and it was like smushing all together and I wasn't getting what I wanted. I was really frustrated. And then I finally settled in and I painted the alley, you know, where the roses come mm -hmm. over from the house. So I was set up in there and I sat there for three nights. We could go in when the gardeners were leaving. If you had a permit, you have a letter from the foundation that you can come. Give them your letter and you're on this list. And if you're not there when they open and close the door, forget it. They're not letting you in. So we went every night and we paint to 10 o'clock at night because the light stayed perfect. Three or four days later, I finally finished my painting. You know, it's the path. It's got the... And now I'm trying to take everything down and carry stuff. I dropped it to face down. Mm. In the dirt. <laughs> face down. Now, there were some British painters there as well. So there were other people, even though it was, you know, the park was closed, there were other painters in there, photographers. They were filming commercials for a Japanese TV thing while we were there. I heard this behind me, and I went, so I picked it up, and I looked, and sure enough, they had sand and dirt just the front of it, and they, I said, are you kidding me? This is Monet dirt. <laughs> I'm not doing anything with this. It is staying on here. He may have stood at this very spot. <laughs> so I brought my dirty painting home. <laughs> And I was really happy with it. So. Um, any? Do y'all have any questions or comments about? Did you bring it to show us? 
Actually, my daughter has it in her house. It's one I won't sell, so. She liked it. Um, anybody that's painted outside want to share some? I was wondering, what is your favorite Well, we can talk about kind of how to do things. Um, if you're interested in learning how to pack or what to pack or whatever, I need some little handouts. Okay, so for watercolors. Um, I do both, and that's why I brought both because um, I started in watercolor and did it exclusively in watercolor for 15 years. Um, and so now, when I travel, I like to take my watercolors and I take my oil paints. Because I don't know what I want to do that day. So I do a lot of filling out journals, and I don't always get through, but you know, I kind of use them and kind of do like a diary kind of thing in there and do sketches, you know, inside, outside, whatever. Um, and so I've tried all kinds of different books if you want to ask me about that. This is one I bought in a CC, it's handmade paper. It's wonderful. Of course, it smells funky when you wet it. Um, this is a cheap joke. Y'all order for cheap jokes. It's a pretty good one, I think. The paper's pretty good. There's one I did in our own story. This one is a. Uh, I noticed that some of them are down. Some yes. Some of them are spiral. Yes. Always the joke is spiral. Yeah, because you can tell me all the way back. Um, I like them both. I mean, I just, I go for the paper and the feel of the paper. Sometimes they don't feel that great. This one is a book I've just kind of discovered called The Visual Journal. I think it's a Strathmore product. Um, but it's nice, heavy, heavy white paper. So you can, you know, you can kind of get wet with it um, and ink it. And you get, it's got different sizes. But before that, I didn't know, and so I thought, I've got to paint a watercolor. I, you know, I take watercolor paper and tape it down, you know, to um, something and paint on it. Um, and I usually paint at 140 pound. Um, but then I'm kind of cheap, so like if I've got 300 pound, I'll take that, you know, just all the time. But these, yeah, these are two that I, I have found. I cut my own paper, watercolor paper, because I wanted to paint on what I was used to, mm -hmm. and took it to a um, copy shop. And you know, you've seen those cookbooks, <laughs> all the junior leaders did. Okay, so they just they put the spiral on there. So I've got to pick, you know, my own paper. So it's it's not even, you know, I mean it's not perfect. But I did that for a while, and I found that worked for me just because I was used to working with the paper. So that's an option. So How often do you, do you have a paintbrush in your hand? Hmm? How often do you have a paintbrush in your hand? Nearly every day. Every day. You can ask my husband if I'm if I'm a little ill at home. He says, <laughs> "You hear me?" Yeah. He says, "He says, go paint." <laughs> <laughs>
just take the left half. It's like the front system block. I can tell because of the, the uh, blocks are different textures. But um, when I was in Eagle I went in a little store over there and cutest little thing, little watercolor stuff. So I tried to do a few things with, you know, use it that size. Um, so, those of you that have worked with people, you know, it's so easy to transport it. Um, this is the wrong way. You get that. So, I take locks, one brush, folded up paper towels, and this is my baby bag. Um, and I love this. It is a little fold up thing you put your water in. Mm. Isn't cute? Mm. And then you fold it back up. Um, so mostly, if I travel, this all goes in like my big purse. Because you know, I want to be sure I've got something. I'll talk about the oils in a minute, but with the oil paints and the tubes, it's got to go in your checking. So that's a 50 50 chance that it's going to get there. Anybody next to watercolor paints? Tubes? Tubes, yeah. You know, nope, I fill up the thing. I mean, that last, you know, that last, I'm usually not gone more than two weeks. So um, these are watercolor pencils. You ever use those? What portable palette do you like? Is it plastic or is it no? Um, yeah, it's plastic. The brand on this. It says watercolor palette. <laughs> I don't know the brand, but I like it because it locks. Why is it Well, you know, because I've got my paint all mashed out, and if I've been painting, even if I think that I've kind of blotted them dry a little bit, they could run. So, you know, I'm going to lock it up, and then I always carry it in a zipper bag. But if you don't carry tubes with you, you can carry this in your chicken, you can carry furs or whatever. Um, if you carry tubes, then you've got to put it in. Mm -hmm. Or you could, but then you could take two pays or anything else. Um, and then just to kind of finish it off, I have, you know, I carry tape, I carry a little spritz bottle, and if you fly, you have to pour that water out and make it full. Um, I carry, this is the neatest little thing. You see these? These are little water pens. And so if I use my, my uh, pencils, sometimes I'll just take this. And then I can just dampen it if I want to make it look more like watercolor. Um, what grade is that? I have no idea. I think it's even. Mm -hmm. I think I got some cheap jelly. Mm -hmm. And then I take markers, and I like the, the water soluble markers because they kind of bleed and they get a really nice look. And I take a Sharpie. Um, I do the credit card, I do that. I always take half a credit card so I can do some texture. Take my little splatter tool. I'm going to do that because if I'm painting outside, I've got dirt roads or something like that. I want to paint in there. Take a sponge. I have a better one than this, but I think a student took it home. Mm -hmm. um, pencils. Magic eraser. Do I use that? Good. It's usually one of the things where I, I always give these to my students. My husband thought that I was the cleanest person in the world because I kept buying them. <laughs> but I was cutting them up and giving them to my students. And so the first day I said, you know, just keep <coughs> painting. If you think you messed up, don't stop. Just keep working. Let's work through it. And then, you know, and then, oh, this is so bad. I said, like, here's your magic eraser. <laughs> <laughs> so. huh? How's that work? It will erase any paint you put down on work to the paper. Yeah, it's awesome. It really is. So, and as far as I know, it doesn't rough up the, you know, it doesn't rough your paper up or anything. So you don't have to scrub it. It's 
So the district drive back in the 70s. Oh, yeah?
you know, when I get it back. So this is kept them. They don't usually break into the tubes. Um, and I label it artist colors, not oil paint. Okay, they don't like that. Um, and I, I brought, are y'all, do y'all know what a manufacturer safety data sheet is? Um, some artists put that inside. Yeah, because it'll say, the one I, yeah, Tesla's made of, and it'll say on there, non-flammable, uh, made with vegetable oils, which is true, you know, it's made with vegetables. Um, I've never bothered to do that. Not this last time when I was in Venice, but the time before that when I was in Florence, and I got home with the luggage, they had opened my cadmium yellow medium. And burnt them. Didn't put the tubes, didn't, didn't put the caps back on very securely. They were on, but they were like, you know, you know how you have to kind of be like this. And I had fingerprints all over my tubes. <laughs> so I'm thinking some agent told me he wasn't very happy, you know, because he got oil paint all over. Him. Sure did. Um, but I, I use walnut oil. And walnut oil is a natural product. You can take this as, as a medium. No problem. Don't take liquid. Liquid is not a natural product. It's an alkyd, and it is flammable. So if you get caught with it on a carry-on, you'll take it. Where did you buy the one? I just get it at our supplies. This one's Graham, M. Graham paints, uh -huh. almond oil. Um, yeah. And if you get overseas and you don't have it, just go to the grocery store. Get poppy seed oil or walnut oil or any what, kind of oil. And what does it do? Huh? What, what is the walnut oil? What does it do? Just if I need a medium. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, just if I need a, a little bit of a medium to soften up the paint. You know, the stiffest paint is going to be titanium white. You know, you squeeze it out, it's going to be harder than all the rest of them. So if I just need it to just, soften it, it just is like a... Use it as yeah. any kind of medium instead. Okay. It's thicker than your family. You can, but you know, baby oil is not a natural product. It's okay. a petroleum product. So, so, in fact, all the gram paints well, probably uses walnut oil instead of. No, I mean you can you can you can carry it with you if you want to. I just don't use it. I use Murphy's oil set. Yeah. Say that again. If I'm in the studio or if I'm stateside and not flying. I use Gamblin Gamsol. Odorless mineral spirits. And um, even in the studio where I teach, I tell them that's the only thing they can have because the, otherwise the odor is just kill you. But um, even with that, I'm very careful with it. I make them keep, keep it covered because even though it's odorless, it's not vaporless, you still be breathing it. I can't afford to lose any braces. So, um, but if I'm traveling, like we're going to Florida next week, um, you know, I'll take my Gamsol and keep it at the house, but then I'll just put a little bit in here mm -hmm. to take out, because I don't really care if I wash my brushes out completely. Right. You know. So, you're driving. Yes. So, you wouldn't take the Gamsol? No. Oh, no. It's fine. Yeah. And it's, you know, you're not an old man. Oh, do you? Okay. We well, you know for oil painters, even if you use rags instead of paper towels and your um, mineral spirits doesn't evaporate off and you put those towels in a trash can, yes, they will. They will. I've known, two, I've known a studio in Florida that's burned twice. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you want to be careful with that. Don't use rags. Um, well, thanks. I mean, I don't have anything else. I brought little bitties. This is Provence. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in the brand of panels I use, I use Raymar. This was at Giverny in the fall. Um, I paint um, further south of Calvary Gardens. You know, right there. Mm -hmm. So I painted in all seasons down there. I used to have a plenty of paint out in the spring. Yes. Um, Tuscany. Same thing. 
Think about the direction and the light. Is it warm? Is it cool? You know, what is it telling me about that day? And so, I will paint gray paintings or snowy paintings occasionally, but they're not my favorite. You know, I'm a spring, summer, fall person. So, you know, I'm, I love it when I go out and it's a nice crisp morning light, you know, and it's, and it's hitting things and I can see colors. So that's kind of nice. So, if you're interested, I have some handouts, plein air, supply list, and watercolor. I have one on wool or acrylic, which pretty much I've got one on some travel tips. I've got a um, MSD sheet, if you've never seen one. This one is from uh, Sari. Make me with them. I'm going to be working for Italy first, right? Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, Robert Gamblin, if you buy Gamblin paints, he has one. I think it's your name. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel the need to put it in your paints, I just need to What does MSD stand for? Manufacturer's Safety oh. Data. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should you take watercolor tools? and pack them in your suitcase, would yes. you need that for them also? Yes. Like if you were going to do exclusively watercolor, you knew you were going to be painting pretty much 18 hours a day, you might want to take some extra colors, and if you do, put them in your check-in. The same thing, put them in something, seal it right on there that it's colors and not, I even spell it like Europeans do. You know, don't put paint on there anywhere because They'll take it. So, black canvas is the fish. Yes, you can. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, if you take old paint, you can say it's nat all natural vegetables. So, but I, the only thing I've ever had taken away from me was my tripod. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why? Yeah. I could kill somebody with. <laughs> Can't you see somebody running in an airplane trying to kill people with a truck? Um, I, I got over there, I got to Italy, landed in Milan, with it strapped to the outside of my backpack. You know, it folds up, it's got this little thing. It was strapped on here. That's through Atlanta. It went through Atlanta, fine. Got ready to come back, fly back home, had it fixed the same way. The first check thing, about to board a plane, and the guy went, Stop. You cannot take that aboard. You have to go all the way back to the check in, and you got to check that. I've already checked my bags. The plane is, you know, we're loading. And he was not even, I mean, he grabbed my arm and pulled me out of line, and there's like a zillion people all behind me. I was like, So I just made a turn, had my little friend with me. Turn, we went into the lady room. I unhooked the thing, I threw it in the trash. I hooked my bag back up, I came back around, I got a different line and made the plane. Otherwise, I would have missed the plane. You know, and you know when you fly to Europe, they got one plane <coughs> out a day. You know. At least you had it through the painting. I did have it while I was there. It went through Atlanta fine and it was so worse. So now you put the plane I do. Yeah, yeah. It goes in the no, I never questioned it. But now, I'm kind of tagged because I travel so much, I think. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll get to the airport and my luggage will be in the checking thing, you know, like when they go through it. I took my granddaughter to Paris in May. We didn't get any luggage. <laughs> so, yeah, mm -hmm. I got stopped in London. Um, but it was an adventure. I was uh, the whole time I'm like thinking, what was I thinking? <laughs> then I was like, oh, this is an adventure. <laughs> you have something you tell your friends about. You stayed in Paris three days with no clothes. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> did you have a picture of it? Yes, we did. Yeah. They brought them to you. Okay, so what do you want? Okay, sure. I didn't, I, when he said, he said it 50 chairs, I went, Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I've got, yeah, I've got 20 something, I think. <laughs> but not 50. <laughs> yes. So they're going to pass that around. Oh, so there's it. I've never used it. 
Yeah, one sheet. And then there's a sheet just on like travel tips, you know, for like packing your stuff. But it's fun. It's an adventure. And I hope that I hope that you all will try it. You know, take baby steps if you've never done it. Take your sketchbook and take your, you know, little watercolor palette or take your, you know, sketch pencils and you know, sit in Central Park and sketch. It's so much fun. Mostly, I'll stick the paint box in it because, yes, if you're if you're outdoors, sometimes it's windy and um, you know you're not paying attention to the paint. So I like to wait in there and I'll put all that. If I've got a camera with me, I stick the camera in there so I got it. If I want to take pictures, I don't have to get into something. No, how you use them? Yeah. Yeah, it goes into this and then it goes into my suit.